All time. right. Well, it is 7.30. Shall we get started? My name is Russ Sandifer, and I want to wish you all a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for participating in Race and Business, a conversation with Black professionals. Um, just to all of our students, faculty, staff, special guests, really appreciate you taking time. I mean, it's, it's a busy time of life right now. Uh, here we are in November. Uh, 2020 has become quite the hashtag and uh, everyone's busy and there's a lot of stressors. So for you to take time out of your evening and be a part of a conversation that's important and that unlike hashtags is not gonna go away when the calendar rolls into 2021, I just can't thank you enough. It's an important conversation. We hope that we created an environment this evening where, uh, where you feel safe, where you feel uh, safe to explore and to, and to think through issues related to racial inequity in the corporate environment, but really in life. And um, I'm really excited uh, to introduce you to three of my friends, um, three very successful, very fantastic panelists. I'm, I'm gonna to get to that just in a moment, but before doing so, I'm gonna just hand the mic over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Professor Andrew Green, just to give a bit of an introduction on behalf of the Accounting, Business, and Finance Department. So with that, Andrew. Did we lose Andrew? I think we did. <laughs> well, we're going to roll with it. <laughs> there it is, 2020, <laughs> after all. You're Andrew, on mute, Andrew. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Am I up, Russ? You're up. Okay. Hello, students. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Professor Green. I teach finance here at Wofford and came to the college nearly 15 years ago after a 25 year career working in the business world largely for corporations, most recently Denny's Restaurants, based here in Spartanburg. I want to take a moment and share with you how the Department of Accounting, Business, and Finance came to put together this speaker panel tonight and the reasons we're doing this. After the killing of George Floyd in May, the subsequent protests around the country, and the acceleration of the Black Lives Matter movement, we professors held several Zoom sessions this past summer to talk about what racial inequities exist within our department and to develop potential action plans. The topics we discussed included underrepresentation of students of color in our majors, underrepresentation among our faculty, and the minimal focus in our courses on topics such as race and business. So this speaker panel, Tonight is our department's first action plan toward offering you, uh, our students, learning, education around issues of race in the business world. We recognize that business from major corporations like Denny's that I worked for, down to local shops here on Main Street, are large and key forces in our society. And I believe that if we as a society are going to address issues such as race, then business needs to be in the game. Many of you students will build careers in business and therefore you represent the future potential for change. While hosting events like tonight's is symbolically important, we professors also recognize that addressing issues of racial inequity requires active long-term commitment. Thus, this event should only start the work toward meaningful change in our department, at the college, and across the country. So students, thanks for being here. I think you are really going to enjoy our panelists tonight. Russ? Thank you, Andrew. And without further ado, I want to introduce our fantastic panelists, uh, starting with the lovely Inga Moffat from Cumming, Georgia. Uh, Inga is waving to you. Uh, Inga received her BS in chemical engineering from North Carolina A&T 
her Master's of Business Administration from Vanderbilt, and she's a doctoral candidate at the University of Florida, a Doctor of Business Administration candidate. And she's now working for Apple in higher education sales. She's a higher education sales executive. And uh, I think you're gonna really enjoy Inga. Thank so, you, Russ. Thank you, Inga, for joining us. Thank you. And next I have Mr. Paul Clark from Buford, Georgia. Paul received his BS in electrical engineering from Morgan State, his MBA from the University of Georgia, uh, his doctor of business administration he is pursuing now at Florida as well. He's a candidate uh, in that program. And he's serving as a product line manager at Caterpillar Inc. Thank you, Thank Paul, you. for joining us. Thank you, Russ. And last, but certainly not least, my dear friend, Danny Blackwell from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, who received his BS in advertising and mar marketing from Towson and is the director of recruiting, talent development, and human resources at G3 Technologies, which is a boutique engineering firm serving telecom operators in the Northern Virginia and greater DC area. Thanks, Danny, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. And I will say that on a personal note, these are all three friends of mine and Andrew and, and has, has also become a friend of theirs over the last few weeks as we've discussed this event and how we thought we could make this effective. So if you'll forgive informality from time to time, uh, if not a lot, because we really do think our friendship is an important part of this discussion as we'll, we'll probably discuss later. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Paul Clark. He's gonna give us a brief overview of some of the macro level statistics that we see in corporate America related to racial inequity uh, before we turn it over to a short presentation from Inga uh, and looking at something similar, but from a company specific level with what is going on at Apple and the racial diversity task force that she's a part of, uh, she'll present uh, some of what they're proposing to CEO Tim Cook shortly after Paul's presentation. So. But certainly uh, appreciate, uh, let me just one last thing before we move on. I did have a couple of administrative notes here. If you're not already in gallery view, um, try, to, try to get yourself in the gallery view so that you can see each of the panelists. Uh, sometimes folks are locked into speaker view. You can go into your Zoom and change to gallery view. I think you'll have a better experience being able to see the conversation happen. Um, also just wanted to note, we're gonna actually be joined by two students later in the session, Trey Hollowell and Alicia Jones. I'll introduce them properly at that point in time. And I think uh, the only last thing I'll mention before we get started with this presentation is Andrew's gonna be watching the chat and Q&A for any additional questions. So uh, there'll be time potentially later in the hour for a new question from the audience. Um, so just keep that in mind as you look at the Q&A in the chat. All right, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Mr. Paul. Okay. Well, uh, again, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, again, glad to be here. And first I just wanted to talk and give you some, uh, some data here of, about race and corporate America. If you look over to the chart first, uh, this is the uh, demographics of the uh, United States broken down uh, by race. Uh, you can see 57% uh, non-Hispanic white, 11% Hispanic white, 14% uh, black and about 10% uh, of the other races. And so when you look at this number in a perfect world, uh, we would hope that corporate America would represent the same type of statistical data. Uh, if you could click once for me, Andrew. But for the number of, uh, Oops, of sorry. Uh, uh, no worries, for the number of black C CEOs and um, for Fortune 500 uh, companies, and you can hit it again, it, it's only about four, okay? Uh, true representation would be around uh, 70. Uh, now you can go to the next slide. So uh, there was an article published uh, uh, in September uh, in the Wall Street Journal that spoke about this very same issue. Uh, why are there so few uh, black CEOs? And uh, they came up with uh, three different uh, points here uh, based off of the studies and research that's been incorporated. And the first point was um, that they noted black uh, employees face more obstacles earlier in their career. And, and especially when it comes to uh, the hiring. They noted for just this one position here, for a postdoctoral position, 
uh, the reviews that the Raiders gave of why they didn't uh, hire Blacks was that they rated them less hireable, likable, and less confident than whites, Latinos, and, and Asian applicants. Um, they also examined some of the call Blacks uh, with some of those Black applicants, and they found that the discrimination levels haven't improved in the past 25 years. Uh, next slide for me, please. All right, the second point they noted was diversity efforts have often just been focused on recruitment rather than retention, okay? Uh, as you saw in the earlier uh, uh, chart or slide there, among Blacks, uh, our Blacks only represent about 3% of the executive or the senior level roles. And a, a third of Black professionals in general, it seemed to leave the company they're in of within the next year or two uh, based on issues as a uh, isolation and workplace hostility compared to 20, 27% of white peers. And uh, lastly, next slide. Uh, oops. Um, the, the last issue was just uh, many uh, black professionals found a lack of senior managers, okay? Uh, again, some of the study, this st another study back in uh, 2019, uh, black executives that held PNL roles 86% of them said they had a sponsor or a mentor, somebody who supported them and advocated for their opportunities that, and that was indispensable in their career progression. And in that same study, they also found fewer black professionals have managers that would give them any kind of growth opportunities. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to back over to Russ. I'm gonna kick it over to Inga for the Apple presentation. Thank you, Paul, for that high level. Now we're going to go down to the company level and what's going on at Apple specifically. Uh, I think a very interesting discussion as well. Thank you, Inga. Can you put it in? Uh, there we go. Wonderful. As Paul said, thank you again for the opportunity. I am super excited to be able to share um, just a few details around what we're seeing at Apple. So while I recognize this is an eye chart, uh, come back, don't leave just yet. What I want you to focus on um, are the red boxes and the numbers in particular that are in the red boxes. What you're looking at is an EEO report or an equal employment opportunity report that really just um, breaks down representation by race across looking at a number of different levels. So you've got professionals, you've got sales executives on the left, you've got uh, administrative support, you have a number of different roles. The interesting thing about this is really over on the right, and I've pulled out kind of the highlights, if you will. So you've got um, males that are represented on the right in the first red column, and then you have females in the second red column, black females, black males. Uh, what you'll see over on the right specifically is the representation. And you can see at Apple in particular, 0.8% of all of our executive leadership are blacks. So that's one person in our particular case. And if you follow Apple at all, that's Lisa Johnson, uh, Lisa Jackson, excuse me, who is our uh, corporate VP of uh, social responsibility. And then following that, you can see at our next level, 2.9% um, of the professionals there are Black. So that's our first and mid-officials, mid-level managers. And then following that, where you have the bulk of employees is our professional level, where we have 1.8% representation of Blacks. And one of the things that we looked at in particular, we started with this data, um, like so many other companies, um, several months ago, but what was really interesting was how dismal, quite frankly, our representation numbers were specifically for Blacks when Apple as a company focuses on diversity and inclusion as one of its core values. So this was eye-opening for us and certainly an opportunity for us to work with senior leadership and put together a proposal that really led us to a couple of key areas, and I'll talk specifically about what those are now. Next slide, please. So in, in going through that data with our senior leadership, um, they were certainly in support um, of us forming a diversity task force 
that was focused on addressing a lot of what you just saw, which was really poor representation, in this case, particularly for Black um, people at Apple. And so the focus areas that we landed on as a group are listening and learning, um, which is really an opportunity for us to understand what that dialogue should look like. It's an opportunity to understand where people are in their journey and really an opportunity for us to be able to help shape uh, what this message and what um, the outcomes will be at Apple. Training and education, we've already launched a number of training modules within Apple, both for individual contributors as well as managers, really focused on how do we improve our, our level of um, awareness around being inclusive. So many of you know that regardless of who you are, you have biases and recognizing that bias and being able to understand how to navigate is very important. And so training and education is really what will help us get there. The thing that Paul talked about uh, specifically was recruitment. And so like a lot of companies around the world, we are focused on recruiting more black talent as well as building a specific pipeline of talent um, for black people. And then career development, um, of course, we want to be able to retain people. What does that look like? We've actually started a mentorship academy, which is going to be very important. It's going to be a 12-month program. Um, and then the last piece is of evaluation and accountability. So of course, you will come to understand if you don't already know, if something is not measured and there's really no accountability around it, then quite often it does not get accomplished. And so these are our focus areas within Apple. It's what we're thinking about to help address some of the issues that I showed you in the first slide, specifically around representation. And I am super excited to be a part of this work and to be able to share with our senior leadership our progress towards our, towards our ultimate goal. And so I'll turn it back over to you, Russ. Thanks, Inga, and to the audience. I hope you found that insightful. Inga, again, didn't tell on herself, but this is the kind of work that's being presented at the highest levels of Apple um, in the coming weeks including to CEO Tim Cook. So, and as Inga has told us in our conversation that we've been having offline over the last few weeks, uh, we, really, we really do see this. And I think Apple is trying to see this as more than a moment, more than a program, more than something expected uh, by the culture at large for the sake of political correctness. There really is uh, a desire from a policy perspective, corporate policy perspective to implement change. And we're certainly hopeful that, that that'll continue to happen. Um, at Apple okay. and at Caterpillar, at G3, at other co great companies where a lot of you students are going to go work and you're going to ultimately be able to be a part of these kinds of these kind of initiatives. Um, as we kind of pivot now to a time of Q&A and really hopefully more organic discussion, I think you'll kind of see some of this from a different angle because it's really the lived experiences of Inga, Paul, and Danny in corporate America. Um, of course, Black people are not a monolith. Um, as, as white people are not a monolith, Latinx and Hispanic are not a monolith. And I hope tonight just you'll see uh, both, both a, a, a rich experience, but you'll even see per, perhaps difference of how, uh, how they've navigated some of these challenges. So my first question to the panelists as I pivot now, and I'm sorry to the audience, by the way, that you can't do, uh, do the uh, panel view, uh, the gallery view. Uh, I'm, we're, we're really sorry about that. Um, as a pivot to the first question here, um, like Paul was mentioning, um, there's a number of statistics. Most recently, there's a, uh, a key report that I saw out of McKinsey and Company, September 2020, talking about racial inequities in financial services um, and how there's still major issues to be addressed. And the report specifically found that Black professionals, in particular, people of color in general, um, are, getting high, are getting hired, they're being promoted, they're getting pay increases um, at a much lower rate uh, than, than you would expect and um, often are overlooked for key assignments as well. Um, so one of the things I think the audience might like to hear is just your experience, y'all, as relates to uh, the companies that you've worked for and kind of how have you sought to overcome similar challenges um, in kind of that space. Well, in no particular order, 
I no think, order. you know, I would start by saying, I, I appreciate what you said, we're not a monolith. And I would then follow that by saying that context is really the key for interpretation. So the requirements, um, you know, out of college, I started out uh, as a manager in training with Abercrombie and Fitch. In the early 2000s, that was really cool. But at that time, I was actually the only person of visible diversity in a managerial role in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia stores. One of the core attributes was identifying people that represented the brand image. And so you had to be physically attractive. And, you know, I was able to do very well in recruiting that, but they weren't really ready. And it took a class action suit for them to then have to implement the percentage of diversity geographically that was reflected for that demographic. And uh, what I found once I became one of 15 recruiters with Abercrombie was that for them, the means of discrimination, once it was enforced upon them, was really more with how you looked as opposed to your race and ethnicity. Whereas at G3 Technology, the requirements are very different. It has nothing to do with your visible aesthetic. It has everything to do with your intellect. We have a very high GPA minimum of 3.7. The average in our office is a 3.9. And so to get a seat at the table, so to speak, to interview with us, you have to have a proven history of excellence. Now the disparities there as it relates to racial minority groups, um, that's another whole conversation, you know, because I'm the one that's hiring them. So it's not necessarily a function of me discriminating against someone's ethnicity so much as it might be me choosing someone that's more qualified. So I do think that context is a factor, um, at least in my personal experiences, where I've always been a minority, but I haven't necessarily felt discrimination. And I think and from my standpoint, um, you know, out of college, I went into the army, you know, right away. And I got a couple, you, a lot of military people, you get a lot of different training and whatnot. But one thing that I took from just being in the army and, and other things, when, when I went to Caterpillar, you know, it was just all about working and working hard, you know, so it, you know, you, you, I came in there and yes, I was one of the few uh, black engineers there, you know, and I, I just had to continue to work and work and work and just work hard. You know, it, you put the time, you put the sweat equity in, into those roles, into those positions. And uh, that's how I was able to manage and go through there. So there could have been, you know, uh, like you said, when you, when, and we're going to get to this, but when you're only the only black person in a room, you have to learn how to navigate. Yes. But Nobody could deny the, the work and the effort that you put into to your craft and to you, into your job. I love what you said with that, Paul, um, because I think it, it piggybacks just a little bit on uh, something Inga said earlier, uh, where she was talking about, we all have implicit bias. And mm -hmm. I tell Russ this, I actually feel that growing up in a predominantly white community uh, I would say Columbia, Maryland, if anyone's familiar with it, it's historic for the racial diversity. It's one of the first planned communities in the nation. And so I saw a lot of diversity, even though white was the majority, but I view it personally to my advantage and that my superpower is I know all the flavors of whiteness and they know hardly anything. <laughs> Oftentimes, uh, th th you know, they don't realize yeah. the level of diversity and differences with us. So I can enter the room and so long as I have the qualifications, I know how to read it pretty well. So one thing I'll add to that in terms of, you know, kind of my professional experience, I've been in professional environments for major organizations for the last 20 plus years. And my first experience right out of undergrad was research and development on Huggies diapers. I worked for Kimberly Clark in Nina, Wisconsin. Now, if you mm. have not been to Nina, that is an experience indeed. And mm. I will tell you, going there was a little bit of a culture shock for me because I had just graduated from an HBCU. Mm. So I got there, I had some very interesting experiences. Um, some of them were not positive, but one of the things that I remember from that is I wanted to make sure I got what I could get out of that experience. I said, I'm here, how do I leverage this? How do I maximize this? How do I learn as much as I possibly can about R&D on, on diapers? Mm. 
-hmm. And then it was an opportunity for me to really kind of develop personally. Um, and then I used that and I ended up going to business school after I had worked for a few years. And just my goal in each assignment is really to understand what it is that I can take from that assignment that will help me grow professionally as well as personally. And so I really look at my career as a journey from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Controlling the controllables. That's right. And just to piggyback off what Inga said, I've one of one of the things is, you know, I've always looked at is what can I learn and who can I learn it from and who's who is the best at what they do? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? How do I get in contact with that person and grab as much information I can from them? I'd always believe that you can always learn something from anybody, you know, mm -hmm. um, and even some of the, the worst managers out there. There's something that you could sort of glean off of, even if it's learning what not to do. So, you know, mm -hmm. always treated every position as a, as a potential learning opportunity. Right. Yeah. So humility. Yeah, I think, you know, none of us want to downplay the reality that there is racial injustice in the world. Yeah. But I think that what we'd also like to highlight is how we've been empowered. You know, we've had parents and mentors and community figures that have invested in us. I know specifically for me, I was prepared from a young boy that I was going to have to be five times better. That's what my parents would say. <laughs> you got to be five times better. <laughs> and so there is a, a sense of a, a work ethic. You know, and when you when you get into the room for the interview, you're not going to perform well if your preeminent thought is that you're a victim or somehow disqualified because of your race. You have to go in there and control what you can and put your best foot forward and hold on to what you've earned. No one can take that from you. No one can take your mind. Love, love this introduction. Um, I think audience, you're seeing the theme and you probably see it throughout. There's not a denial that racial inequity exists, but these panelists are interested in, in helping tell a story about how they've navigated it. And, and I think as, uh, as we think about you know, their resilience, there's definitely gonna be that theme that's gonna come up again and again. And um, I'm really challenged by that resilience in spite and in face of real racial uh, equity issues that we do need to address from a federal policy level, state, local level, corporate level, not denying that, but uh, I think we'll hear this theme a couple of times over. Um, pivoting uh, now, Andrew, if we could cue the video that we had uh, arranged for our, the audience. Uh, enjoy this video. I think, it's, uh, I think it's pretty impactful. And then we'll move into our next question. You see that? Yes, sir. So uh, you almost I apologize. Got yeah, 
Uh, I apologize for the audio if anybody had audio issues and uh, obviously a great video from Procter and Gamble. Um, wow, big, big, uh, big impact. Um, you know, that, that issue of, uh, of the look kind of brings us to a question about microaggression. And so could we just talk uh, openly about microaggressive behavior for the audience, for those that aren't familiar with the term, uh, one leading psychologist has defined it as the everyday subtle intentional, oftentimes unintentional. Going back to that issue about implicit bias, it's not about judgment here. We're all in a different place in our journey of understanding. Uh, and, and I'll say for, for me as a white person, I'm, I'm like, maybe I'm in elementary school trying to get to middle school, my understanding of the black experience uh, in our country. We're all in different places. My friends here, they all have a PhD in white. You know? <laughs> And, and you know, but, but there's not judgment here in the regard that we're all on a journey. We all have these implicit biases. So as we think about microaggression, what this definition is telling us is that it's, it's often unintentional. So again, the everyday, subtle, intentional sometimes, but oftentimes unintentional interactions or behaviors that communicate some sort of bias toward historically marginalized groups. Um, and obviously they signal disrespect and lack of belonging and it takes someone seeing uh, someone in their role to suddenly change the look, to recognize, oh, the, you know, to change the behavior. So just to the panelists, can you just share what this looks like in your life, whether in the workplace or beyond it? Well, I, I tell you what, I, I you, Danny said this video was coming, you know, and I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, I was not prepared honestly because you it it, is, it rings so true because um i think i've almost become numb to it honestly a lot um of the subtle little gestures and, and not just in, in the workplace but in general but in the workplace which and i want to bring it back to you know um the extra little comments that you you, you will receive you know everybody else has X amount of time, but you have Y amount of time, or you're for the same issue, you know, I might've been uh, talked about a little bit harsher. You know, this is experience I've had in the army, I had in Caterpillar, you know, um, and you just, you, like I said, I, you, you sort of come numb a little bit to, to it for a little bit, but then, you know, I always go back to my goals and what I want to achieve and what I want to do with my life. You know what I mean? And just keep forward and focus on that. You know, I have my family that I need to worry about. You know, um, it is a shame, you know, but, you know, I just keep, I keep pressing on and I keep thinking about my goals and, and what I want to achieve um, uh, in there. So one of the things I'll say about microaggressions, I, they're extremely common and we probably have all, <laughs> uh, used a microaggression in one form or another. I mean, it's, you know, it's beyond race. It can be gender. It can be mm -hmm. um, any mm -hmm. number of factors. But I know for me, one of the ones that I hear quite frequently, and to Paul's point, I'm almost numb to it, is you're so articulate. Yes. My, my thing is, well, what, what were you expecting? I mean, exactly. were you expecting me not to be articulate? So I get that a lot. I, I'm, I really am numb to that one but I hear that quite often. I also remember when I was um, early in my years at Apple, how you know I had someone lean over to me to explain something to me that was being presented and it was completely unprompted. I didn't ask for anything, but they felt like they needed to educate me. And I'm thinking I, at no point did I not understand what was going on. So it was just, you know, things like that, you, you remember them, you kind of file them away, but you know, at some point um, you really do become numb to a lot of things that, that happen around you. So yes, I, I've experienced them. I'm sure I will continue to experience them. And I'm also, I also try to be mindful as well, um, you know, from my perspective, whether, like I said, whether it's around gender or ability or any of those other things that I am not um, using microaggressions when I'm having a conversation. So with right. that, what Danny, it? you want to weigh in on that one? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys, I agree with everything you said. Um, I don't like to take a siloed approach because I don't think that's the way life is. You know, um, 
maybe to a degree we put on a different hat in the workplace. Um, man, I can speak to that. I mean, you hear me talking. I've been in talent acquisition my entire career. A lot of cold calling. People see me, they're hired. One of the first things they like to say, oh, you're black. I'm like, so what am I supposed to say? I, I knew you were white, but you know, <laughs> get, him, get him back with a little aggression, you know, a little microaggression. Yeah, right. No, um, I mean, it is what it is. I, the reality is we are a minority. And so for me, I, I do expect that to a degree. Mm -hmm. I also realize that in the workplace, that is one facet of my life. Um, and, and again, context makes a lot of difference. So, yeah. you know, working in the industries I've been in, they've been uh, corporate. They've been more in the realm of, of white collar. Uh, in moving to Baltimore City, the day-to-day -day experience, it can be a bit more challenging. Like Atlanta, it's a black city predominantly. The wealth disparity is great. And so I have to be mindful that if someone doesn't hear me speak and I go outside and I'm wearing a hoodie, I could very easily be Trayvon Martin to my neighbor. So for me, I can't create this dichotomy of what it's like at work versus what it's like going to the gym, what it's like living in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that education can be helpful informing people of what not to say but i think at this point in time do people really not know what to say <laughs> i don't know and i just correct you russ you have at least a high school education in blackness <laughs> stop tripping <laughs> thank you for my diploma um, he didn't say you graduated he said <laughs> oh oh my, my fault i was presumptuous there i uh, love love the discussion paul Want to jump well, in there? Like if piggyback because it goes off the video and goes off what Danny Ingo said. You know, one specific experience that usually come with myself is that you know my name Paul Clark. It's not a very Afrocentric name. You know, I don't have a deep voice. You know, or anything else like that. So basically, as being one of the head engineers, you know what I mean, on a job. When I used to go to a job site, you know. I'll come there and people will be like, oh, you're Paul Clark. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're the head engineer running this. Yes. You know, it was not even expected that, you know, me, you know what I mean, would be the person that's going to run this and say what's going on and directing different people. So it's, it was always, it, you always get like, oh, okay, you're Paul Clark. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yes, I, I'm the mm -hmm. head engineer here and I'm going to, I'm going to run this site. So, you know, it's, it, like I said, you, you start becoming a little numb to it, but it just, mm -hmm. all of this discussion has really just brought that back on up, you know? Yeah, I think one thing that might be helpful to add is that I do believe that I have been really fortunate to have been given a unique opportunity with my current employer. I was hired by a Korean American man that is extremely mindful and in, in seeking to be uh, fair in his hiring and, and creating opportunity. I think opportunity is key. And um, I think that for me to be entrusted with the role that I have as a director, I've never felt from my current employer that I've needed to change my appearance, my look. You know, there was a coworker once who was like, you know, you have a pretty focal position. You might want to change up the hair. You know, you got the Afro going. The nose ring wasn't always there. I don't even know if y'all can see that. I did that when I got real comfortable with my job. But... <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I do realize that my situation is unique. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I would encourage students that may be a visible minority, um, I would encourage them as they're interviewing for employment opportunities to inquire about what it looks like to progress in that company and, and what are the statistics racially, what people are managed, what black people or people of color are in managerial or executive roles. You know, because it may, I know one statistic that Inga spoke to is at Apple, you know, people getting hired into the sales positions, it looks pretty equal. It starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller as you move up. That is one thing I have not struggled with, but I think it's an important thing to be mindful of. Yeah. This is great. Well, what is great, there's sadness in this, but uh, this is a great piece of conversation. Definitely appreciate 
those thoughts. We're going to open up to the next question, which is actually going to come from Trey Hollowell, and then Alicia Jones has come in. These are two students, uh, panelists, I think I told you about. Uh, for the audience, uh, as uh, I think Kay is going to try to get Trey Hollowell in. Uh, so Trey is uh, from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. He's a sociology and anthropology major and a business minor. Uh, he's a senior member of our uh, men's basketball team. Um, and looking forward to hearing from Trey. Are, are you there, Trey? Looks like it. There we go. I'm right here. Floor is yours. <laughs> oh, you ready? Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, thank you guys for this. This is great. This means a lot to me and a lot to a lot of people around here. But uh, you guys have touched up on my question a little bit, but I just want to give you a little background of my question before I ask it. So uh, in my lifetime, I've been fortunate enough to uh, attend high level uh, educated schools uh, like Walford and in high school, I went to a predominantly white private school. And so I've been in that situation where I've been the only black person in class. And uh, at Walford, I have a couple classes where I've also been the only black person in class. And uh, I just wanted to ask you guys like through your career, like uh, in the workplace, uh, have you often found yourself as the only black person in the, on the team or in the room? And if so, how has this felt? And uh, how does this affect your work experience? Well, well Trey, I'll start. Thank you for the question. You know, um, I've been the only, I, similar to yourself, since high school, elementary school, been the only black person in the room. And I've uh, not only been the only black person on the team, but I've also been a leader, you know, where I was the only black person and, you know, my whole team was, was white. Um, and, you know, I, again, uh, Russ has said it, some others have said it, you know, you just have to be confident in who you are, you know, yeah. what you bring to the group and what you bring to the team. You know, you can never feel like you're not supposed to be there because yes. you are. If, you, if you're there, you deserve to be there and just work your butt off and work your butt off. Yeah. I think that I'll add to that too. First of all, Trey, thank you. And congratulations on where you are in your journey. Um, like Paul, I, I too have been the only black person and I will tell you, there's a little bit of what I call kind of emotional labor around that because you, in some cases you can feel like you need to represent well because you are the only black person. And as we talked about, we're not a monolith. So that's not necessarily the case, but you can feel like that. So it can be emotionally heavy, especially if it's you know a situation where it's the first day of school or you are just starting in a new role and you really feel like you have to prove yourself. But I think the thing that Paul talked about in terms of being prepared, right? Don't let anyone else outwork you. Um, yes. Focus on building a network yes. and really just think about doing a great job wherever you are. But I mean, I think it can be heavy and I've been there, um, you know, a number of times. And so I would just encourage you to, to continue to, to think about how to move forward in the journey and just uh, embrace where you are and um, be confident in who you are. So. Right. That's, those are my words of wisdom for you. <laughs> I don't have much more to add other than what they said. I want to start by saying thank you both for being here. Yes. I see you. I appreciate you. And you guys are just getting started. Lord willing, you have a long journey ahead of you. <laughs> and you have an opportunity to be empowered. I don't know what access you have to Professor Sandifer, but he's been a huge instrument in my life. You know, I similarly to Inga and to Paul, uh, I've been the only one a lot of times. And sometimes, quite honestly, I haven't even noticed it. I told Russ yesterday, I remember it was my freshman year of college. I was in a health class. It was a lecture of about 150 people, okay? The professor says, if you're Italian, stand up. If you're Irish, stand up. She goes through all of these Anglo-Saxon <laughs> origins. And I'm still sitting. And so I said, if you're black, <laughs> you know, I, st <laughs> I stood up. I was a division one swimmer. Tell me, you know, another one. I know you don't. 
Okay. <laughs> so, I've been I've been the only one a lot of times we can use that to our advantage. Absolutely. We don't have to carry the burden of all of our people on our back, but there are many that have come before us and they've walked through a lot more. This is what I'll say in wrapping it up because I want us to be empowered. Our people came from Africa. They made it across the Atlantic. They were enslaved. They made it through Jim Crow, the civil rights movement. We can do it, man. We can do it as the only one. We have access to education. We can be confident, pull our shoulders back, be prepared, show up. Yeah. All right. Love that. Love that. Trey, thanks for the question. Panelists, that was great. Uh, Going to move to Alicia Jones now. Quick intro for Alicia. Sorry, I should have introduced you before we got to that first question, Alicia. Alicia is uh, from Lancaster, South Carolina, and she's uh, majoring in accounting and Spanish double major. Uh, she's also uh, the event coordinator for the Wofford Women of Color. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alicia now for her question that she has for you all. So hi, everyone. First, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you guys for participating tonight. I cannot tell you how excited I am right now. You probably can see it because I'm like jittery. Um, but I really do. I have really enjoyed you guys um, hearing y'all talk about just how you are progressed in your own professions. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, beginning to my question, just to give a little context, um, I come from a small town, Lancaster. It's super small. And coming to Wofford, I pretty much was the, it was a culture shock. Um, Ms. Morfitt, I think I'm, I want to say that right. Um, you saying it as well, hearing you talk about that as well, it was definitely a culture shock. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I didn't know anybody. I had really no friends. Um, and so it was really hard to adjust at first. Um, but I had the awesome, I had the, I was very lucky and blessed to be able to find awesome upperclassmen that were able to take me under their wing and um, kind of help me navigate my way around campus. And so that helped me in turn want to turn around and do that for underclassmen behind me um, because Wofford is a predominantly white institution, but I also feel like um, we also have to, as upperclassmen, have to turn around and help bring up those that are behind us and kind of keep that going so that it doesn't just drift off and um, African people, students of color just feel like they can't come here. Um, mm. So to go into the question, um, as a Black professional, can you just discuss, can you guys discuss um, an experience of having a mentor or being a mentor to others? And uh, second part, what would you suggest students do to find mentoring relationships? So I'll start on this one. Um, I think mentoring is extremely important, um, both professionally and personally. And um, thank you for that question because I think it's so important and it's one of the things that people that don't look like us do exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. And so I will tell you in my career, I've had a number of mentors and actually I was just thinking about one of them. Um, I had a mentor, it was a white woman, um, extremely successful. But one of the things that she told me is, Inga, hard workers work hard, networkers move up. I want you to focus on building your network. And that's something that I will never forget because mm -hmm. wherever you go, yes, you're going to work hard. Yes, you might have to work twice as hard, but remember that Everything in corporate America or wherever you end up is about relationships, yes. right? It's about relationships. And so you want to make sure you take advantage of the opportunity to interact with people, get to know people, be authentic in those relationships. And so I think that's one of the biggest things I've gotten just from working with a mentor um, was that particular thing. She said, Inga, you, yeah, we can all work hard. Yes. But that workers are the ones that move up. And so you want to keep that in mind and make sure you're focusing on building relationships that will serve both you and them well into the future. I love what Inga, how you articulated. Beautiful. Thank you. 100 percent agree. That's been the same experience in my life. I'm naturally highly relational and it's afforded me the opportunity to pretty organically establish a very large network. So I actually haven't ever applied to my jobs. They've sought me out. I think you'd be good for this. Another thing I like that Inga highlighted is that race does not have to be a factor. That's right. You know, go to the people that are competent and willing and care. Russ has in a way been a mentor to me. 
in a lot of different ways. He's just had different experiences, slightly different personality. He's still crazy. But I mean, you can, you can, <laughs> you can find people, find people that are doing what you're interested in and seek them out. My current employer, when we read a book and we find a good insight, he says, write the author. I said, what? He said, write the author. They'll write you back. They have written me back sometimes. And he's actually writing a forward for a new software design book because he wrote the author. So there are a lot of ways that you can establish a network that can be really intimidating, especially when you're young and when you're in college and you're like, I don't even know where to start, but just start on campus, like what you're doing now, you know, and then observe opportunities and email, take the risk, put yourself out there. And it I, I can't really add too much to what these two have said. They, they said a lot and I agree with all of it. Um, but on, on, on the mentor case, you know, I've had a, a couple of different mentors and, uh, but the most predominant one to me, uh, went back to just the work and he always told me hard work would never be denied. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't care, you know, who you are, or what race, gender, whatever, hard work mm -hmm. would never be denied and wherever you go. And as I try to navigate that through the army and then through Caterpillar, um, I've took it upon myself, if, you know what I mean, with uh, another young en engineers, um, I've always been able to be a mentor and be available to them. You know, I, I didn't like to see people struggling because I knew what it was like when I struggled, especially being a young engineer. So uh, three things I'll tell you that I've always, I told everybody that I, that I mentor. Uh, that's helped me throughout my whole career, you know, number one, always be on time, you know, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're late or you're on time, then you're, you're late, you know, but, so always be early and you're, you'll be on time, turn in everything that was asked of you, you know, that just, that goes to whatever position you're at, you know, and then just work as hard as you can because mm -hmm. nobody can deny if you, if you're giving your best effort, so. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say that I forgot to mention is I can't emphasize enough humility. Yes. That is a core attribute that anyone regardless of race should have. And what I mean by that practically speaking is fear is not an attribute of humility. That's an attribute of pride. And so it's gonna require risk taking. It's gonna require sometimes being in uncomfortable situations. It's gonna require a level of fortitude and resilience to put yourself out there, to receive the mentorship, to take the harsh criticism. You know, the, the man that's mentored me in my adult life, he is relentless. I mean, to have an average GPA requirement of three nine, you know, and so sometimes it can hurt your feelings. <laughs> you know, it's not good enough, do it better. But that has helped me actually be better. So I would say to you, Trey and Alicia and anyone else watching, be humble. Yeah. And, and can I just say this one last thing? Because Danny made me think about it was don't be afraid to fail. That's what another mentor told me too. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid to fail. You're, you're going to fail. You know, you're mm -hmm. not always going to win at everything you do. You know what I mean? But don't be scared to make decisions. You know what I mean? And if it's the wrong decision, at least you know what not to do next time. So, you know, I've, I've had plenty of things that I've done, you know, and plenty of things that did not work out well, but yet I'm still here. So yes. just don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> you know? this, this has been a nice segment, y'all. Thank you very much. Alicia and Trey, hang in here with us. I'm just going to ask another question. It's appropriate for you to stay. Um, if we have time at the end, we might get to a couple other questions here in the chat. Thank you, Ryan and uh, Mike and Anonymous. Thank you for those. We'll try to incorporate those. Uh, the last question we definitely wanted to hit on uh, is, you know, the panelists, you, you know this, in our audience, we have people of color, both uh, students and faculty and staff, and, 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 and we also have white students. And one of the things I think we're all interested in knowing is just what, what can white students take from this time, this discussion we had tonight? What, what can people of color take from this time um, from tonight? Could you just speak to that briefly? Don't overburden your black friends with answering all the questions. There's a lot of good resources available. There's a lot of good books. Um, so I would start there and then maybe start asking questions. And I would also say, don't be motivated by guilt. Be motivated by compassion. 
be motivated by a genuine interest to understand someone's narrative that may look different than yours. That's how you're gonna establish relationships. I'm sorry, am I still there? Okay. You're there. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say along with what Danny said, it's really about, you know, as he mentioned, you want to be curious, right? So as whether you're black, white, Hispanic, whoever you are, it's all about curiosity. You know, how can I learn more about other people, other mm -hmm. cultures, other experiences? And so really, as he mentioned, the burden is on us to figure out, you know, how things are different, what it's like. The other thing I want to say is be authentic, right? Yeah. So this is, this is an opportunity. We're all on a journey. Um, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to ask crazy questions. We're going to ask great questions, but you want to be authentic. And you want to think about the relationships that you have and whether or not you're being inclusive in your relationship. When you look around, whether it's how you do work or life or school, you know, does everyone look like you? Does everyone sound like you? Does everyone think like you? So are you intentional about really creating an atmosphere and an environment that does include others? And so I would probably leave you with those things, really to just focus on being curious, being inclusive, and just really, you know, how do I, how do I stay open and authentic um, on this journey? So that would be my recommendation. The only thing I would add to that would be in an organic manner. Yeah. So in that curiosity, you join, and this is not a stereotype for you, Trey, but I'm just saying, if you want to play basketball and they're all black guys on the basketball court and you like to play basketball, get out there, form some relationships. That's, that, that doesn't have to be curious. That can be organic. And the only piece I would say, it's, it's sometimes it's just the small things. I think a lot of, a couple of the questions that came up a lot of times was, you know, being the only black person in the room. Well, if you're in the room and you're white and you see that only black person there, you know, say hello, make them feel comfortable, make them feel welcoming. Like sometimes that. it's just the little small things that could mean so much to somebody. So, you yes. know, it, it, it doesn't take that much to say hello. Hey, do you need some help? How are you doing today? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not being disingenuous. It's really, you know, you could develop relationships that way. So sometimes it's just a little small thing, you know, just maybe not just to pass somebody by, but just acknowledge that they're in the room, that, that you know, that person is there, you know, mm -hmm. those are the little small things that we can all do, you know? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Johnson, Dr. Johnson noted that Paul and Inga uh, attended HBCUs. Can you speak to their role in your development as a student and beyond? At, sure. At, so go, go ahead, Paul. Well, I was going to say at HBCU, Russ, was, was that the question? Yeah. How did, how did uh, attending HBCUs, uh, what role did those play in your development? Do people even know what an HBCU is, a historic black college university? So, yeah, thanks so for clarifying for the audience, Dan. I, I would say, and I'll let Ingo go, but it, it was everything to me, you know. Um, again, like Trey, I, I was in a predominantly white schools, and uh, I purposely went to an HBCU. My, my parents went to HBCU, and they went to Norfolk State, and I went to Morford, uh, Morgan State. So, you know, um, it, was, it was a very great experience. It was very knowledgeable. I, I took from that though, um, you know, not just the friendships, not just the, you know, the experience of being in all black school, but just the, you know, uh, uh, a community and, and, and um, how that shaped me going, continuing out into the world and the rest of the business is that again, mostly white high schools, you know, all black college, you know, when I went and dealt with the army, I feel like I could really talk to or really, you know, deal with anybody or anything. So it, it really just helped shape me and form me as, as the person I am now. Yeah. So, yeah. So a couple of things I want to add to that. Um, yes, I went to North Carolina and State University. Absolutely loved it. Um, if I had to do it again, I would go to the same place. And here's why. I think one of the things about HBCUs, especially right now, is a lot of companies are flocking to them, right? They, they see HBCUs as an opportunity to really identify black talent, 
Um, they see it as a place where obviously they can be very efficient in terms of time. And so I think HBCUs actually represent um, an underrepresented source of great talent. Absolutely. And um, as a student there, I had incredible opportunities. Um, my, my major was chemical engineering. I had internships every single year. The top companies came there. I worked for 3M, I worked for DuPont. I worked for a number of different companies getting experience that, I mean, I just felt like it was invaluable to what I was going to do. And when I got ready to graduate from North Carolina A&T, having excelled academically, but also culturally, I pledged a sorority. I mean, I really took the entire experience. I had eight job offers. There were eight major organizations that had offered me an opportunity to come work for them. So I felt like I was adequately prepared. And even when I think about my experience today, I'm like, oh my goodness, it was so rich you know, even beyond the academics, but it was so rich. And I really felt like it gave me a strong sense of community. Um, and it really provided a solid foundation. And I think a lot of times people think about HBCUs not being up to par. They're not, you don't have quite the rigor. And I would certainly argue against that um, just based on my personal experience. But yeah, absolutely pleased that I, I made that decision and would certainly do it again. So, you sold that so well, they're ready to transfer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's, oh uh, let's, gosh. We, I love we need it. to bring, bring it to a close, sadly. Um, I just want to end by, number one, thanking um, Paul, Inga, and Danny. I want to thank Alicia and Trey for being a part of this. I mean, what a privilege to sit and listen and hear from your experience. Um, I'm grateful for your friendship. Uh, I'm grateful that uh, our audience was able to see um, what you've gone through, what you continue to go through, to see your strength of character, to see um, how you're navigating these issues. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Green, um, for uh, running the meeting for us. And um, I guess I will, uh, at this point, uh, the meeting is officially closed. However, um, we could stick around for a couple of closing uh, questions. There's a couple in the chat we didn't get to. I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't leave the chat open just for a little bit longer. Dinner might be one. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for, for the rest of you that were looking forward to an 830 close time, feel free. No, I'm joking. Uh, no, we'll thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's it's a lot incredible of opportunity. Yeah. And Trey and Alicia, keep, keep pushing. Keep yeah. going, guys. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So one one of the questions was in the chat, and I think this was addressed earlier, which is you know panelist experiences um, in terms of advancement, and have you had to work five times as hard as your white majority counterparts to earn promotions? Well, I I think I was the one that referenced the five times. I can't evaluate, you know. If I've had to work five times harder, I've been five times more prepared though, I think. And so I just want to present myself to be able to take advantage of whatever opportunities available. So uh, we had another, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I think you I'd had like a question to, that you fielded. There was another question in the, in the um, quick Q and A that I thought was interesting. Um, and it said that it mentioned that I had mentioned uh, the underrepresentation of minorities within the finance department and within finance majors. And the question is at Wofford, I believe any student has the option to choose any major they see fit. If this is the case, do you believe that the reason minorities are not as present in majors such as finance is because of the way our society has made minority communities think of fields like finance as white males? Do you think many minority students come into college thinking that they don't fit the build of a finance major so they don't even think of, per, of pursuing it? Which is a great question. And it's a question I think for us in the finance, you know, we finance professors what can we do to change that perception? And it is true that if you look out in the finance world, 
um, the statistics show that it is white male dominant. Mm -hmm. um, and even women have had difficulty breaking down those barriers and minorities as well. I don't know, does, do, do all of you, is there anything we can do to help break down those conceptions? Like, Representation matters. You know, so I do think that uh, maybe identifying some black finance professors that are interested in working at Wofford would be helpful. But I think that, again, this comes to uh, the generational disparity as it relates to opportunity. And so in hiring engineers, for instance, I can tell you that 90% of the people I interview, one of the first questions we ask them is, how did you get into this? Well, my dad was an engineer. My grandfather was an engineer, you know? And, and so for them, it's the natural progression. I don't know that it's so much of this idea that that is a white male thing, as much as it might just be an ignorance as to that being a viable option for them, you know? It might be that they don't feel academically prepared. I'm not trying to stereotype. I'm just trying to say what it is or right. could be, right. you know? And, and so I, I know that in, in engineering, at least, that is very much a factor. I partner with NSBE, which right. is a society of, of Black engineers on college campuses. And one of the difficulties I find is that for them, much like me, sometimes they're the first generation, you know, in this particular field. And so even as it relates to academically having the, the grades necessary to enter in, you know, they just didn't have that mentorship. They didn't have the tutoring. They didn't have the, the extra help. And so I think there are a lot of factors that contribute, but I think that representation would be a controllable and in being able to see yourself reflected and then be able to ask that individual if they're willing for some insights, that mentorship, the networking that Inga was talking about, I think that's a really practical step that could be taken. I agree with what Danny said. And the other thing I would say is starting early, right? So one of the things that has been the focus really quite frankly for the last 15 years is Blacks in STEM. There's been a lot yes. of on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Yes. So there hasn't really been a lot of focus outside of that, quite frankly, but there are a lot of community initiatives to really increase the representation um, of Black talent in STEM. And so to Danny's point, I think there's an opportunity maybe to look at finance from that perspective and say, how do we cultivate talent starting much earlier such that we can begin to kind of change, you know, the, the, the setup, if you will, the, the, um, the representation within finance. So I, I would probably say that, but I think to your point, it's just that people don't know. It's not even in the consideration set. Right. So many people have been focused on STEM and I see a lot right. of activity in that area. Okay, thank you. Thanks My for the uh, bonus time. I think that concludes uh, the questions that I see, Andrew. Do you see anything mm -hmm. else? I think we uh, did a 10 minutes of bonus time here. I wish we had two hours for those that hung on with us. Thanks for the 88 of you that stayed around. You wouldn't believe how awesome this would be if we kept it going. I mean, the there. first hour was free. If you're willing to write a check, we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am hoping. I am hoping that I am hoping that we will have race and business part two in the spring. All right. Fantastic. I'm here for it. No, it has been a pleasure and um, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. So thank yes. you all. Yeah, thank you very much. So my pleasure to, to speak. <laughs> yes. To our audience, thank you again. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to be a part of this. Um, I know my life has been enriched yet again, and uh, I hope yours was as well. With that, we're signing off. All righty. Take Thanks. care, guys. Take care. Thanks again. Thanks again, everybody. All right.